All right. Uh, thanks very much uh, for Dick for agreeing to do this interview and welcome and thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Samir Kohler. I am a professor of computer science at University of Maryland. And my association with Dick Karp goes uh, long before I first met him. Uh, almost 32 years ago, he published his Turing Award lecture called Combinatorics, Complexity, and Randomness. And that was one of those rare moments in my life that suddenly my own future became clear to me and I was greatly inspired by Dick's uh, Turing Award lecture. And I ended up going to Cornell to pursue a PhD in algorithms, actually working with one of Dick's collaborators and friends, Vijay Vazirani, who was my thesis advisor. I was very fortunate to be advised by him. After that, I moved to University of Maryland, where I've been on the faculty. Uh, Dick Karp uh, is a giant in the field and is known to all of us. But I just wanted to maybe mention a few of his awards and accomplishments. He won the Turing Award, as I mentioned earlier, in the mid-'80s and subsequently won the National Medal of Science, is a member of the National Academies, won the Kyoto Prize, the Ben Franklin Prize, and has really been a thought leader in our field. So I'm really honored and humbled that you agreed to do this interview with me. Um, I think you have been a pioneer in the field and have led uh, you know, theoretical computer science at UC Berkeley for almost, I think next year will be five decades since you've been here. And I thought this would be a very good time to do an interview where you're almost finishing 50 years of your career at Berkeley and also uh, stepping down as director of the institute, which is really an amazing, amazing place. I had the uh, good fortune to be here for a few weeks on sabbatical. And so I wanted to take this time maybe to ask you a few questions. And the same way that your Turing Award lecture inspired me, I'm hoping that some of your answers will inspire other young people in the field. And uh, I know all my students are excitedly looking forward to this interview okay. and, and uh, listening to your answers because they have been reading your work and learning about your algorithmic work in the 70s and 80s through the classes that I teach. So, so thank you very much uh, for agreeing to do this. My first question has to do, uh, you spent several decades at UC Berkeley leading the field of theoretical computer science. What are the big changes that you have witnessed because you've been through the whole birth of the field till today? Well, if I can take it back to my uh, graduate studies, um, I was a graduate student at Harvard in the late 50s in the computation lab. Uh, and uh, at that time, the, co the term computer science had not been coined. Uh, there was an organization, ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, that already existed. Um, Yet, but although computer science really had, had not been identified as a field of study, there were uh, many uh, sources of uh, what became computer science. The sources came from uh, numerical analysis, from uh, operations research, uh, from electrical engineering, uh, from mathematics. We, we knew about uh, Turing and uh, Shannon and... and uh, uh, other, uh, von Neumann and other, uh, other founders. Um, but computer science was really not organized as a, as a discipline. Um, theoretical computer science began to take shape in the early 60s, I would say, and that was also the time when computer science departments uh, came into existence. And the topics at that time were ranged from uh, switching theory and finite automata. We knew about Raven and Scott, and we knew about digital design, uh, compiler design, and formal languages were studied. Um, as I mentioned, numerical analysis. Um, but um, most of the branches of uh, computer science that we now study uh, really hadn't been identified. Uh, there was no cryptography. Uh, cryptography really came along in the 70s. Um, there was certainly no quantum computing. Uh, the, the notion of looking for connections between um, computer science, uh, theory of computer science, and various scientific fields really hadn't uh, come about. It was really around the turn of the century, around 2000, that we began uh, uh, under, under the designation of the computational lens, we began looking at connections between theoretical computer science and field, fields like physics, uh, uh, economics, and biology. Um, the, in the early days of uh, theoretical computer science, 
uh, say, starting in the, in the 60s, um, the problems usually arose in a practical con context and were rather natural and relatively simple prob problems, uh, sorting, searching, uh, basic search in a graph, um, uh, arithmetic processes, you know, uh, th things that really had a, 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 an applied role and, and were natural. Um, complexity theory developed in a, in a strange way. Um, we knew about Turing machines, um, but the uh, work on computational complexity took a, a strange direction in the early 60s. Um, uh, instead of studying computation in full generality, we tended to look at handicapped computers computers that had only two tapes or two heads or, or operated on a stack uh, were, were limited in some way. And uh, they defined certain classes of language, languages. But the idea, uh, notions related to combinatorial explosions, polynomial time, um, really were not current with the theoret theoreticians of that period. Um, the, um, Hartman and Stern's paper in 1965 introduced some of those notions. Uh, the work of Edmonds in operations research was also very influential. And so the field changed. Uh, the, the P versus NP question came, came about. And as I mentioned, over time, all, all of these other subfields have become prominent. Uh, uh, cryptography in the 70s uh, and early 80s. Um, and then uh, other areas like uh, interactive proofs and, and, and the like were, were studied later. Uh, the role of randomness was recognized probably in the 70s. People started thinking about randomized algorithms. And in general, um, the field has uh, branched out so that the bodies of knowledge, the frontiers are quite extensive in many of the sub areas of theoretical computer science. So whereas in the early days, we could sort of pick up problems off the ground. We just ask, look over the shoulder of any programmer, and we, we would Fun see, problems. oh, you, uh, you can use hashing, or you can use a search tree, and so forth. Um, the, there's, there's been a, a tendency to uh, make things much more mathematical. I think one, one uh, aspect of this is that many people who would have gone into pure mathematics in earlier stages are now uh, quite powerful mathematically and applying it to theoretical computer science. Right. And uh, each of these uh, sub areas has itself become a substantial body of knowledge. So you can't just walk in and start working on it. So one follow-up question to something that you said earlier. So do you think it's possible that in the late 50s, people were thinking that these uh, constrained machines might be easier to build or they might be easier to program or they might be a lot faster when specialized hardware comes up. And that's why they were trying to understand what the power of those machines no, I might think be. No, I think it was just a game. Oh. If it had any practical motivation, it probably came from uh, linguistics where uh, Chomsky and others were trying to uh, create the Chomsky hierarchy and were interested in various uh, mechanisms of uh, language structure that could be modeled by machines, context-free languages, for example. I so I think that was the, the motivation rather than the idea that you could, um, you know, that you could build machines with two tapes more right. easily than machines with okay. many tapes. But also today, computer, being a computer scientist is well understood in society as what that means. Yeah. Was that a strange term to label yourself as in the 50s? You should tell somebody I'm a computer scientist? I don't think I ever used that term. Oh. Uh, I, my mother told me that I, was, uh, that, that I should go into the field of data processing because it was really going to be big. And so that, oh, that was good advice? <laughs> that was good advice, yeah. So I thought of myself as being in data processing. I was also. Um, very attracted to operations research, which was a, a hot field in the, in the, already in the 50s. Uh, and I, I read the works of Fulkerson and uh, Danzig and people like that. And um, that was, I, I saw p opportunities for myself there. I liked discrete mathematics and I could see many things that could be done. So 
If you asked me what I was, I would have probably said that I was in operations research or in data processing. Okay. Also, um, what do you think were the main contributions of theoretical computer science in the last 50 years, if you had to highlight well, a couple? The last 50 years? Um, well, I think I'd like to focus on the maybe uh, on the lifetime of the Simons okay, Institute sure, of course, yeah. talk about that. So I think there are a number of, of threads uh, that have come about um, over the last several years. Um, the uh, uh, spectral graph theory and, and uh, related areas of uh, li linear algebra have proved to be incredibly important and uh, led to new algorithms for old problems. I remember uh, some time ago, my friend Gary Miller uh, told me that, uh, that um, uh, the best way to solve network flow problems was through linear algebra, and I told him it was crazy because <laughs> obviously the best way to solve fl flow problems was to push flow right. one path at a time through the network. He was right, I was wrong. <laughs> Um, so that, that's been a very powerful uh, development. Um, uh, cryptography has become more and more relevant, uh, um, especially with computing in the cloud and uh, delegation of responsibility to other of agents and multi-party communication. Uh, that, that's a very deep and exciting area. Uh, the connections with the natural sciences, um, mechanism design in uh, economics, uh, uh, connections with uh, genomics and uh, molecular biology, um, uh, I think uh, connections of computation to the, the study of computation in the brain is uh, emerging, although we really still know uh, very little. Um, so, uh, and of course, the whole machine learning, data science um, development. Uh, it, it seems that nowadays you can become a millionaire by announcing that you're a data scientist <laughs> and getting multiple offers from right, right. companies who think that if, if, you, if they could only hire somebody imbued with artificial intelligence, that, that person could sprinkle it over all of their con concerns and, right. and make, make the company successful. So, so the data science, big data, artificial intelligence direction is extremely important. Um, parallel computation was quite important in the uh, in the 80s. I think there was a lot of work on parallel yes, computation. Yes, I did my PhD thesis Most, on that topic, right? Right, yeah. and um, that seems to have faded. But I, uh, I expect that it'll be making a comeback because it's really so terribly relevant. So I believe it's maybe diminished in the theory community, but actually the multi-core processing is still a very big topic. That's right. Within architecture and so on, right? So yes, that's true. But it hasn't been accompanied by a corresponding push on the push on the, th on the theoretical side. It seems to me that that's overdue. Um, I expect that uh, um, new directions in cryptography will keep coming up. Lattice-based cryptography is interesting because. Um, uh, Lattice-based methods um, may even surpass what a quantum computer can do, so oh, they I don't see. depend on factoring. I see. Um, but the direction that will be taken uh, will depend a lot on the initiatives of people who just decide to start programs like the Simons program. And, uh, That's terrific, yeah. Yeah. So uh, changing gears slightly, let me ask another question. So you had an exceptionally successful career. If you had to think back to the days when you were both an undergraduate student and a PhD student, were there any spe special qualities that you think you focused on that were, in the long run, had a big payoff? Well, I sort of wasted my time as a graduate student. I should have spent more uh, time learning various branches of mathematics. So there are certain very relevant fields of mathematics where my knowledge is uh, shaky, and I'm therefore condemned to work on fairly simple intuitive questions for the most part. Um, I think the, <clears throat> the uh, most important experiences I had in my student days were first of all, finding out that I was really uh, good at probability, discrete probability and mm -hmm. probabilistic reasoning and I had a, a feeling for probability and statistics and uh, other branches of operations research. Um, 
uh, my grades were mediocre because I didn't work on, I, I sort of wrote half of my courses off because they didn't seem to be, I didn't quite understand why applied complex analysis was going to be important in I my see. career. Um, but I had some summer jobs where I was able to contribute and that led to my, f have, uh, to a growing feeling of, uh, of confidence. So uh, I would say that my graduate career was exciting because we could certainly see the re looming importance of what we were doing, uh, but was somewhat defective in terms of uh, concrete learning. I could have done, I could have done more. Uh, however, I was lucky in, going, in landing a job at IBM Research uh, because there I could uh, work under more experienced scientists and really sort of develop my expertise. And uh, I had the opportunity to work with Michael Rabin, who visited the IBM lab, and uh, um, Alan Hoffman, uh, who you may or may not know. Oh, he did a lot of work in circulation and flows, right? Circulation and flows and linear algebra and, right. and, and uh, spectral graph theory. And he was a model for me. And uh, uh, rather excellent colleagues uh, like Shmuel Winograd and uh, Arnold Rosenberg. So I, I was lucky to get that job at IBM. So that relates to my next question, actually. So you spent almost a decade at IBM. How do you think your life might have been different had you just stayed there? After, after 1968. Well, if I just if I had just stayed there, um, first of all, I should say that I, I loved my job at IBM. Uh, uh, the the 60s when I was at IBM were a period where the company was ascendant. It had 75 percent of the computer market, and so they could afford to give some of us the luxury of just working on whatever we wanted to do. So it was. Um, it was a perfect job for me, and uh, I left only because I thought that uh, my social life and involvement in uh, radical causes could be enhanced by coming to Berkeley instead oh, of I see. Okay. <laughs> Westchester County That's in, certainly in, true. Yeah. in New York. Um, but if I had stayed, first of all, I would have had to retire at 65 because they sort of booted everybody out at that oh, I see. age, so I have managed to continue to 83 uh, since the university doesn't have age limits. Well, that's fortunate for us. Fortunate yeah. for me, at least, as well. Um, I think um, all of these industrial paradises like Bell Labs and IBM and Microsoft Research and so on uh, have their ups and downs. And so you can't really count on uh, on a, an, an extended career where you have the freedom to follow your curiosity. Uh, I think there are nowadays very few places uh, where uh, you can just dream your dreams without being um, uh, limited to uh, short-term objectives. That seems to be the way it's going in industry. So <laughs> as a flip side to that, I would argue that maybe for some researchers uh, being in an industrial lab setting actually allows them to be, in a sense, closer to the problems that people are running into. And at, in academia, you're slightly removed from that, especially as a theoretician, right? So. Um, yeah, this is, this is true. I think it depends on the individual's attitude and, and initiative. Um, so e even at IBM, I think, we were somewhat cloistered in the mathematical sciences department. I see, I see. But, I, uh, but uh, we, we definitely had connections with what the company was doing. In particular, um, there was an extraordinary person named John Koch who won the Turing Award for his work on computer architecture, um, who spent his time just wandering around the lab like Johnny Appleseed, taking ideas from one place and planting them in another, and so he would Usually around the time I was getting ready to go home in the evening, he would drop by and bend my ear for half an hour about his latest ideas about compilers. That's wonderful to hear. So he was the same person who I think who was instrumental in designing several chips and architectures at IBM, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, yeah. I've so definitely there, read a lot so about there, there was that awareness. I probably didn't exploit it as much as I might have, but it was there. So I guess my next question also relates to the move to a, an academic environment compared yeah. to being in an industrial lab. So I'm sure you are incredibly proud of all of the PhD students you've graduated and in terms of the further impact 
that their work has had. But let me ask, like, how do you sort of decide between weighing your time between working very closely with students versus thinking deeply about one question on your own, which sometimes mm -hmm. I know some people prefer to just sit, prefer to sit in their office and spend 80% of the time focusing on one problem that they care deeply about. And especially yeah. if it's a very hard problem that has been open for decades, sometimes it may, may not even make sense to put a first year PhD student to work on yeah. P versus NP. But if you want to work on it, you have the luxury to just spend your time. So how do you decide, like, how, how do you weigh your time? And Well, I wouldn't work on P versus NP unless I had an idea how okay. to do something with it. <laughs> yeah, and I don't. Um, I found it immensely enjoyable to um, have the opportunity to advise students. I've had more than 40 PhD students, including about 10 women. Uh, about 10 of my students have gone into computational biology, and many of them have done better than I have done in that field. Um, uh, I, I'd like to interact and um, don't consider myself such a deep theorem prover that uh, long periods of isolation without human contact would lead to very much. I think I've done better by, first of all, working with people who are smarter than I am, and uh, secondly, uh, working with uh, enthusiastic students. Um, in terms of directing students, I try I try to give suggestions, but I try not to dictate what they do. I, uh, I think it's very important for them to develop their own uh, tastes and emphasis. And I, I, I uh, prefer it if they um, have a very large voice in defining their own problem. Um, beyond, beyond that, uh, um, I think uh, some of them like to spend their time interacting with other students. Uh, others uh, have very deep ideas, and, and, and um, really I learned more from them than they, they learned from me. Um, uh, okay, usually there's a period of, uh, of pessimism that comes over a student at some slow period in his or her progress, and I try to uh, get them over that and, and ensure them that, that, it's, that it's happened to me and that uh, it's normal and that if they keep, uh, keep at it, they'll uh, come through to the other end of the tunnel. Um, so actually, I think that's very valuable advice for most of us or many people who are just starting out as yeah. professors in the field to learn how to advise students. So yeah. thank you for that. Are there any particular skills that you focus on in developing or instilling in your students? Um, I encourage them to read, to write, to um, develop their teaching skills, to uh, polish their ability to present a, a, a coherent argument. Um, I also often advise them to take on a secondary interest other than theory, uh, and most importantly, um, not necessarily to work on the most fashionable theory problem of the day, uh, but to take into account whether the problem they work on might in the end actually have some impact on the real world. Um, Thank you. Uh, computer science also has been building many bridges with other scientific fields. In some computer science departments, I think there is some tension between emphasis on core computer science versus interdisciplinary applications. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts or advice for us on the issue? Well, first of all, I'd say that um, much of the interesting work going on nowadays is interdisciplinary. And um, uh, any university, the, the traditional structures within a university uh, should not be a deterrent to the formation of these inter interdisciplinary connections. I know this is hard because um, people get promoted by their departments, and um, many of the uh, and the curricular aspects of teaching are, are and all of the everyday business of teaching are run by departments. Uh, whereas um, for a field like um, computational biology. Uh, or branches of it like neuroscience, 
or uh, the study of economic mechanisms, you really need to go, uh, go beyond, I think. Uh, uh, so each university will have its own way of accommodating the interdisciplinary studies, but it's important to be flexible and, and not let the standard chains, chains of command in the universities um, deter people from forming broad connections across boundaries. So uh, I don't have any specific organizational suggestions. I think that's a matter for the universities. Each one has its own traditions. Uh, given the recent advances in AI, there's an ongoing debate about whether machines are going to take over the world and become malicious. Is there any real danger of that in the immediate future? Should we worry about that? What do you think? Um, I think that I'm not worried about their taking over the world. I think that's very far-fetched. Uh, I see no evidence that artificial intelligence in the sense of a universal intelligence rather than one that's very focused on a defined area uh, uh, will, will, will occur. So um, I, I just haven't seen, it seems that the um, achievements associated with artificial intelligence are, have always been on very stylized defined problems defined by some, somebody else. And um, any broader awareness that a computer might have, um, I, I just haven't seen much evidence of that. Uh, so chess playing computers don't know that they're playing chess, for example. Right. Um, uh, so I think the, the idea of uh, computers being uh, smarter than we are is is very far-fetched. Uh, I, don't, I don't expect to see that happening. I, there, there, are, there have been many incredible surprises. I, I, I must say, though, that I would never have thought that computers could play Go better than the best human player, and, and moreover, learn to do it by uh, playing Watching. against uh, by, by playing against themselves and, and gradually improving. That that came as a shock to me. Um, so, but I, I don't really feel that the notion of computers with um, uh, broad intellectual and intuitive capacities uh, uh, will will come into existence. I just if at all, it's going to be well beyond my lifetime. But um, at the same time, AI and machines are going to be decision makers in the future. Well, that, that's yeah. that's where I think the true danger is. Okay. I think um, as we delegate decision making to computers, um, whether it's um, you know uh, directing missiles to their targets or or um, uh, more mundane things like. Um, 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 issue, issuing loans in a bank or, or, uh, or hiring people for jobs. Um, uh, we tend to rely on uh, algorithms and automated methods. Right. And um, I think there are some very deep intellectual issues that I hope we'll study at this institute about what it means for a decision-making algorithm to be fair? What does it mean to be biased? What does it mean to be ethical? What does it mean to be socially responsible? Um, and uh, th that's the area where we lean on computers to land our airplanes and uh, issue right. our contracts. And if we, if we uh, yield the control to um, Algorithms whose properties we don't understand. Uh, I think we're heading yeah. for heading for trouble. Uh, this is related to the current uh, achievements in deep learning, because uh, they are undoubtedly um, very um, impressive for style certain stylized problems. Um, but we don't understand how these. We don't un, uh, really have a characterization or a clear or, or an insight into what these uh, neural networks are, are, are doing, and therefore, how can we trust them to perform a medical operation or pilot an airplane? Uh, 
uh, precisely. Mm -hmm. So three weeks ago, there was actually a workshop in this room yeah. where there was a lot of interesting talks about adversarial machine learning that I found fascinating. Right, right. exactly. Yeah, that, that's another area that we'll probably be attacking here at the Institute. Okay. So that naturally leads to my last question. So the Simons Institute obviously has been a game changer for theory. What do you see happening here and how it's going to f f shape the future of our field in the next five years? Well, uh, I already mentioned a few areas that right. I think will be coming, coming up. We'll probably be doing more on distributed and parallel computation, um, newer directions in cryptography. Uh, quantum will be coming up with some frequency. Uh, that's an incredibly important and exciting area, although we don't quite know where it's going. Um, but really, it, it, uh, in, in running the Institute, the challenge that we've had is not having good topics. We have so many good topics to, to right. uh, pick from. It's really uh, finding uh, leaders in the field who are willing to ex exert their energy to organize a program and see it through to the end. So we're, we're really um, in the hands of the community. Uh, and we, so far, in the early days when we were just starting, um, most of the programs were Berkeley-centric. We, we, uh, we, we relied on our immediate colleagues to organize those programs. Uh, fortunately, over the five years of our existence, um, the, um, community, the broad community has come forward and we've had organizing teams that have taken the responsibilities to run programs and, and the um, as I say, there are so many appealing areas, and I think the the key issue is whether people from the community will continue stepping forward. And uh, I see no reason to doubt it. Okay. okay, so that's the end of my question. Since we have an audience here, we have time for one quick question from the members of the audience. Anyone? What advice would you have for young faculty members uh, who are starting off? You gave some excellent advice for students. Uh -huh. what, so faculty members, what should we be doing? Uh, first of all, I applaud them for taking a position where they're going to be torn between teaching, research, administration, grant getting. It's the, the first few years of a faculty man, member's career are, are very demanding. I, um, I uh, am very lucky that I had enough experience at IBM that I would, was able to come in with tenure and I didn't have to go through the anxiety of uh, <laughs> uh, qualifying for tenure. Um, I would say um, that it's a much harder existence than they would have if they joined a, um, the research division of a company. Um, and so, the compensation is, if you love to teach, it's a pleasure to have a captive audience and have the opportunity to do that. If you if you like to work with uh, young people, of course, this is the, the only way. Um, I think that that even though you know the the hours are long, long and the responsibilities are heavy. Um, Many people will want to do it because um, nowadays you can't really have a curiosity-driven research program in a company. It, it used to be that places like, like Bell Labs and IBM gave people that opportunity to sort of dictate their own career, and I, I fear that those days are over. Um, and, and so if you go into a company nowadays, you can expect to be um, given a niche uh, related to the company's efforts. And some people love that, but if you, if you want to just dream your own dreams, uh, the only way to do it is to be a faculty member or a perpetual graduate student. Not even at Google or Facebook or they don't, they don't do that? No, uh, people, I mean at Google for example, uh, is this going to be on the record? <laughs> yes, it is on the record. We are being taped, yeah. Uh, <laughs> At, at Google, I think um, you have to work on the mainstream 
concerns of the company. Now, fortunately, um, at least four days a week, and then you have one day to theoretically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, now, people, many people, seem to love being at Google, and I guess the reason is that the areas like advertising are so broad and so multi dimensional that there, there are plenty of questions for them. So they're willing to restrict themselves to such an area. And of course, Google does have, or Alphabet, which is the parent company, does have uh, a lot of efforts that are much more speculative. And that, in that way, it's, I would say that Google has, be, has increased uh, the proportion of people who really can be doing speculative things, whereas um, most companies have shrunk it over the recent time. Yeah, just to, to add to this, are you worried about those companies sucking up the talent out of universities and putting them into proprietary research where they can't even publish and talk about it? Uh, I haven't been worrying about it, but now that you point it out, I should. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should be, yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, a, AI, they, they, they hire undergrads, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I see uh, some of the, the, the best minds are being drawn into, into uh, corporate activities in, in robotics, for example. Um, so at the same time, I'll add that sometimes these companies enable certain forms of research that are tougher to do in academia because I also think they have access to tremendous computing resources which is needed for these pro projects. And sitting as a professor, you might not have the funding to be able to do that, whereas sitting at Google, you could. So there are things that the company will enable yeah. happening. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. And uh, I, one of the selling points for Google uh, that they emphasize is that the decisions you make working for Google on, on products will affect hundreds of millions of people. And that, that's very powerful, a very powerful argument. Uh, um, at a university, uh, it's less likely that you'll be any, able to have that degree of right, influence. Right, right. Yeah. So in closing, I'd like to thank you again for agreeing to do this. I wanted to also take this opportunity to thank the wonderful staff at the Simons Institute that made this possible at short notice. So thanks, thanks everyone, and thank you very much thank for agreeing to do thank this. Thank you very much. Yeah. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks. And we can continue doing questions off the record after this interview okay. is taped. OK, thank you for coming, all of you. <laughs>